Welcome to another tutorial video. This time we're going to go over a very specific topic, which is the working capital adjustment in M&A deals and leverage buyouts. So a very common question we get goes something like this. Can you explain how the working capital adjustment in M&A and LBO deals works? How do you model it and how does it change the results? Also, why do acquirers adjust the working capital of target companies when they close deals? So if you want everything here in writing and you want the screenshots in the Excel model, go to this URL breakingintowallstreet.com slash KB slash leveraged buyouts and LBO models slash working capital adjustment. I'll also pin this in the comments as the first thing, or just Google working capital adjustment PIWS and you should find it. Here is the very short answer to the question. The working capital adjustment is most common in acquisitions of private companies that are done on a cash-free, debt-free basis. And the idea is that it keeps the buyer's effective price the same, but it changes the proceeds to the selling shareholders of the target company in the deal. And it changes the price based on how well or how poorly the company manages its working capital relative to its targeted working capital as the deal closes. So it incentivizes management to run the company normally as a deal closes without doing anything crazy. If a company's working capital is below the targeted level, the buyer will reduce the purchase enterprise value and pay for additional funding to bring the working capital up to the target. The result is that the buyer pays the same price, but the selling shareholders get less. Let's take a look at how this works in Excel in a very, very simple LBO model here for a private company. So let's say that this company's operating working capital target, I'm saying operating working capital here because we're excluding cash and debt. Let's say this target is 100. And let's say the company has 75 of accounts receivable and 30 of inventory and 30 of accounts payable. I'm showing it as a negative here because we subtract it in the working capital calculation and then 25 of deferred revenue. So their net operating working capital is 50, but the target is 100. What happens in this case? In any deal, especially one involving a private company, there's going to be a headline purchase enterprise value. So you take the purchase multiple of 12x and then you multiply by the EBITDA just before the deal closes or when the deal is announced, 50 million right here. And then you make an adjustment for the working capital. So you look at the company's actual working capital down here, and then you subtract the target. And so if you're below the target, this is going to be a negative number. If you are above the target, this is going to be a positive number. In this case, it is a negative number. And this gets you the adjusted purchase enterprise value in the deal. So in this case, it gets adjusted down to 550 because the management team has run their business such that the working capital is below the targeted level, which means that the private equity firm or other acquirer needs to fund this company and put in additional working capital to bring it up to this $100 target. You still calculate the purchase equity value the same way, but now you use the adjusted purchase enterprise value instead. So you take this, you add cash and subtract debt. And then in the sources and uses schedule, the uses side is now based on this adjusted purchase enterprise value and the working capital funding. So the additional funding the company needs to bring it up to the target, or if it has an excess, the amount the private equity firm can take out. So we link to the adjusted purchase enterprise value. And then for the working capital funding here, we go up and we flip the sign on this. Since the company's below the target, what that means is that the private equity firm or acquirer needs to put in additional working capital, an additional 50 of working capital to bring it up to the target. On the sources side, everything is the same. We still have 250 of debt being used because we're using 5X EBITDA to fund this deal. And then the investor equity is the same. We take total uses and we subtract our sources so far, which is just the new debt issued here and our sources equals our uses. So this is how it works when there is a deficit, when the company is below the operating working capital target. The adjusted purchase enterprise value goes down, but they have to put in some of their own cash to bring the working capital funding up. So the effective price here is still 600. Now, when the working capital is above the targeted level, the buyer will increase the purchase enterprise value and take some of the company's excess working capital for itself after or as the deal closes. The result is the buyer still pays the same price, but the selling shareholders get more. Let's go here and let's change around some of these numbers. Let's say that the accounts receivable here is 150 and the inventory here is 55. So now the operating working capital is 150, the target is 100. In this case, the private equity firm now pays a higher purchase enterprise value, 650, and the selling shareholders get a purchase equity value of 600. So they go from only getting 500 in the other case to 600 now because they have this working capital surplus. In the sources and uses schedule, 
the adjusted purchase enterprise value is higher, but now the working capital funding is a negative because the PE firm or acquirer can take some of this excess funding for itself. Total sources and total uses stay largely the same. They're not exactly the same because the fees here change a little bit, but they're pretty much the same as they were before. And that is how this works. The bottom line and the most important thing is that none of this really changes the investor equity in a deal like this. The effective price, the adjusted purchase enterprise value, plus or minus this working capital funding stays the same regardless of the working capital at close versus the target. And that's the whole purpose of this adjustment. What really changes is the purchase equity value, the proceeds that go to the selling shareholders. And I have some graphs over here illustrating it. In slide form, if working capital is above the target, you can see how the working capital funding there is a negative, reducing the effective price from the adjusted enterprise value. And then the proceeds to the selling shareholders are 600 in this case. If it is below the target, the PE firm or acquirer needs to put in additional money to bring the working capital up. And in this case, the proceeds to the selling shareholders are below what they would have gotten if they had managed the company to that working capital target. So that's how it works. You probably have some additional follow-up questions though. So let's go through a few things here. You might wonder why buyers do this. And the short answer is they don't want to acquire companies that need additional funding just to run their normal business on day one. So they do this to shift some of the risk to the seller. So for example, right before a deal closes, a seller could just forget to pay its bills or delay them. That will increase its accounts payable and reduce its working capital. The buyer doesn't want that. It wants the company to keep paying its bills on time as it normally would. Or the seller might not order enough inventory and that will boost its cash balance, but it will reduce its operating working capital. The buyer also doesn't want this. It wants the seller to keep ordering inventory and selling products as it normally would. You might be wondering about the model impact the short answer is that there really isn't any impact if you set up your model correctly. If we go back to the simplified model here, you might be wondering about something like the change in working capital line in the free cash flow projections. Nothing changes here because this is the change in working capital. This adjustment to the working capital takes place right when the deal closes, but after that, working capital still continues to change in the same way every single year. So there really isn't any impact in the cash flow projections or the exit calculations or the IRR or anything of that nature. If you do have a full three statement model, I'll pull one up here and it is a more complex model, you will have to record this adjustment in something like inventory or accounts receivable as we do here. And it might be a positive adjustment, it might be a negative adjustment, but you'll have to record it somewhere here. So you will see that. But even in this more complex model, the actual change in working capital stays the same. So yes, the absolute value of working capital differs, but the change stays the same. If you're wondering about why working capital adjustments affect the proceeds to the shareholders and the price, it's because working capital is a core business asset. It's part of enterprise value, but excess cash is not. If you're wondering about the definition of working capital, what goes into it? I don't have a short, easy answer. It varies quite a bit from company to company, but you will see common items like accounts receivable, inventory, prepaid expenses, accounts payable, and deferred revenue quite often. Cash and debt tend to be excluded from this definition because they're not viewed as net operating assets that are core to the business. If you're wondering about how the working capital target is set, so for example, how do we know here that the target should be 100? This example was just arbitrary, but in real life, you would look at things like working capital as a percent of revenue or the change in working capital as a percent of the change in revenue and see how these trend over time. If you're wondering about companies with negative working capital, like many software as a service companies, Many of these firms have very high deferred revenue balances that make their working capital negative. Buyers should know this and they should account for it with reasonable working capital targets and deals, but should and reasonable are highly subjective and you will actually see quite a few arguments and debates over what to do in these types of deals because of this issue. That's about it. Let's do a quick summary. So the Excel mechanics here are pretty simple. We went over it briefly, but essentially you have to look at working capital versus the target. You then make this adjustment and get the adjusted purchase enterprise value. If you are above the target, this goes up to a higher number. If you're below the target, this goes to a lower number, which affects the proceeds of the shareholders. In the uses side of the sources and uses schedule, you record the adjusted purchase enterprise value and the working capital funding, which could be either a positive or negative, but the sum of these two should always add up to the same number. Buyers set these targets because they don't want sellers to manipulate their business and do shady things right before the deal closes. The model impact is very small if you set up your model correctly. 
There will be an adjustment on the balance sheet if you have a full three statement LBO model or M&A model, but in a simple cash flow only model like this, you won't really see much of anything except for in the sources and uses schedule. And then working capital definitions and targets, these vary a lot. Different companies define it differently. It differs a bit in different industries, but I gave you some general guidelines. The overall targets tend to be set based on working capital relative to the company's revenue and free cash flow and EBIT and other metrics like that over time. Hopefully now you know a little bit more about this topic and why it doesn't really matter that much, but it is still good to know for modeling purposes.